Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I am really excited for today's live um, because we have the great honour of uh, Dr. Louise Newson joining us to have a chat about hormones and specifically sleep and hormones. Um, and hi, everyone. <laughs> hi. Um, I am just going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Louise because she's pretty impressive. Um, and then I'm going to bring her into the live for um, our Q&A. So uh, Dr. Louise Newsom is a GP and a renowned menopause specialist. She's passionate about improving education about the perimenopause and menopause and also improves, improving awareness of safe prescribing of HRT to healthcare professionals. Louise has worked regularly with West Mid Midlands Police and many other large organisations to provide advice regarding menopause in the workplace. She's the director of Newson Health and has also set up a not-for-profit company, Newson Health Research and Education. Um, and she's also involved in research with colleagues in Warwick University, the London School of Tropical Medicine and also King's College London. She also works closely with HIV charities to help menopausal women, women living with HIV. She has also <laughs> launched a free menopause app, Balance, which has been downloaded over, over 30,000 times since it launched a few month, months ago. And today, just to top it all off, she launches um, the Menopause Charity, which she's going to tell us some more about. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Dr. Louise Newson in. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. How, I'm just going to turn my volume up a little bit. Um, Dr. Louise Newson, Hello. thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's such, such an honour, such a pleasure, and you're a very, very busy lady, so thank you for taking the time. No, um, I, I know that this is going to be a very popular um, live with our following, um, and we are focusing today on sleep, um, because that's an area of focus that we're looking at um, uh, this month, and obviously we've been looking a lot at um, how lack of sleep can affect the skin, um, but obviously hormones are <laughs> such an integral part of um, how we sleep and the quality of our sleep and, and that can affect us at any life stage not just menopause we should point out um, so what would be great is if you could I've done a little introduction for you and told everyone how impressive you are <laughs> but what I think what would be really lovely is if you could tell everyone a little bit about how you have got to this point what was your journey to becoming you know your your Instagram handle is the menopause doctor what led you to that point. Mm -hmm. So I'm a GP and a menopause specialist. And so before I went into general practice, I've done a lot of hospital medicine. So I'm very interested in diseases and disease prevention. So um, it, it sort of naturally lends itself to menopause really because as you might know, with menopause, you have low hormone levels. With low hormone levels, there's this increased risk of various diseases, such as heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia. Um, and so balancing those hormones with the right dose and type of HRT then reduces risk of these diseases. So I've always incorporated menopause care as part of my medical um, work, if you like. And then um, in, nine, in 2015, some NICE guidance came out on the menopause. So NICE is the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence. So these are government endorsed guidelines. And they basically um, confirmed, really, looking at all the evidence that the benefits of taking HRT outweigh the risks because of all the health term um, benefits, if you like, from taking it. So then I um, started talking to some of my friends because um, at that stage I was in my mid-40s, a lot of my friends in their mid-40s, starting to experience symptoms and a lot of them were getting antidepressants and being told they can't go on HRT because it's too dangerous. And hmm. I thought this is absolutely wrong. So I did some more training, became a specialist, and then I couldn't get a job in the NHS because NHS um, doesn't really provide adequately at the moment. Hopefully that will change for menopause. So I set up a clinic just to, to help some people. And then I would quite quickly realised that women are really suffering. And I set up um, some social media and got engaged with the media because the media got it wrong um, for so many years, really, about menopause and HRT. We've been fed this information to say um, HRT is dangerous. It's going to give us breast cancer. We should avoid it. We should get through our symptoms. We should battle our way through them and come out the other side. 
So I thought, well, actually, I'm going to play with the media and try and give women the yeah. right information, and then they can make choices that's pertinent to them. And in fact, I think that's where I first came across you. I mm. saw you on a BBC interview. Right. Um, you know, the usual, sort of once a year or twice a year, it comes around again, HRT is yes. dangerous. That's right. And yeah. there you were defending it, but also in a very, in a very calm way and in a, very, in a sort of very reassuring way. Mm. You know, oh, I remember yeah. watching that and yeah. thinking... I, I felt like it was a safe pair of hands, someone oh, who actually yes. knew. Yeah, and I think, you know, I'm a doctor um, and it's really important for me that I practice evidence-based medicine. So if I'm seeing someone with diabetes, blood pressure problems, or the menopause, then it's giving them the right information based on the right evidence. And sadly, healthcare professionals have also been fed the wrong information. So it's not just women as well. So. I do a lot of education work for not just GPs, but for doctors, nurses, pharmacists, other healthcare professionals, and obviously a lot of work empowering women. So we know because the menopause and perimenopause come at a time when we're often not expecting it. And the average time um, that it occurs or the average age is 51, but around one in a hundred women under the age of 40 have an early menopause. Yeah. So it's not an old person's disease. It's not even a disease. It's a natural process for most of us. Some people it's forced on us um, because of having their ovaries removed or damaged by um, certain drugs, say like chemotherapy. So it's, it's really important that we have the conversation because it's been a stigma for so long. So mm -hmm. my work has sort of spiraled out of control, if you like. But I, every way I go, I listen to stories about women who have given up their jobs because of the anxiety, the brain fog, the fatigue. People have given up their partners because of the irritability, the aggression, the lack of libido that occurs. Yeah. You know, and I do a lot of work with cancer charities and a lot of women who've had cancer have treatments that lead to an early menopause. Yeah. Women are neglected. We've just yeah. launched um, um, done, uh, a booklet that we've just written with Sophia Forum, which is a HIV charity women with HIV are more likely to have symptoms, less likely to have treatment. So there's just millions of women suffering. And it's Who are being abandoned. Mm. Yeah, totally. And, yeah. you know, I'm not really feminist, but if it was happening to men, it wouldn't really have been allowed to be this bad. And even if you just ignore the symptoms and think about the hormone deficiency, because it's a hormone deficiency, we need to think about replacing these hormones because many women are living for decades with their menopause. So a lot of diseases could be prevented or reduced in incidence by replacing hormones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I want to actually come on and talk a little bit about perimenopause um, specifically mm -hmm. later because that's probably where I am. And um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about that phase um, uh, particularly. Um, right, I, we're going to talk some, about, a bit about sleep. And I think what would be great is if you could talk about the role that hormones play in our sleep quality. We know that they can disrupt sleep. Like, you know, if you're someone that perhaps doesn't sleep for the two days before your period comes, or, you know, you might be pregnant and suffering from sleep disruption, or it might be menopause and hot flushes, you know, whatever it is, we know that they can play a role. But also sleep deprivation in itself can then affect um, uh, our hormone levels. So, you know, it's a sort of vicious Circle. Absolutely, and all these hormones, so our main hormone we have in our body is estrogen, um, which is produced by our ovaries, but we also produce a lot of testosterone, which um, a lot of people think testosterone is a male hormone, but actually we produce more testosterone than estrogen before the menopause, and we have pro pro uh, progesterone as well, which is, again is produced by our ovaries, but all these hormones don't work in isolation, they all work together, so even hormones such as your cortisol or your thyroxine, they all have all these, these sort of feedback processes, if you like. But <clears throat> one of the things that hormones work really well for is helping sleep. And it's one of the things that people really thank me often for when, when I give them HRT because their sleep returns. And obviously night sweats is a very common symptom of the menopause yeah. because of the low estrogen levels that occur. So if you're sweating in the night, of course it's going to wake you up if you're dripping with sweat and you need to change your... Well, you know, I, I always say to people that sleep deprivation is a very effective form of torture. Absolutely. <laughs> and, it's been used for and, years as a form of torture. and you might be having symptoms that actually, you know, not that anyone should have to cope with symptoms, but if you're getting a good night's sleep, very yeah, often you can cope. With so much you can cope. Absolutely. Um, but even if people aren't getting night sweats, they often find that they're not in such a deep sleep, that their quality of sleep isn't as good. And they're often still waking up in the night for no reason. And sometimes people 
describe this overwhelming anxiety or sort of impending doom feeling that happens at four or five in the morning, which is often when hormone yeah. levels are lower. And and you're right, you know, people who um, are more sensitive to their hormones find just a day or two before their periods they get this. And that's because the estrogen levels dropping at that time. Um, and we know that if women have low sleep and men as well if, if, if people have low sleep they have an increased risk of diseases such as diabetes heart disease obesity and all these things increase during the menopause as well so it's a, it's a double whammy and yeah. um to try and say to a menopause woman well you just need to relax you need to you know play some nice music and, and spray lavender on your pillow of course that might help but it's not going to replace the hormones um and then women feel worse because it might just make you a bit angrier <laughs> yeah and it's very hard and then Symptoms of, of the menopause, such as um, sort of brain fog, memory loss, poor concentration, anxiety, can all be exacerbated by poor sleep as well. Yeah. So often when sleep improves, like you say, everything else can improve as well. And, yeah. you know, if you're feeling tired because you haven't got the hormones, um, you've got some muscle aches and joint pains, you're not going to exercise in the same way than if you've, um, you know, had a good night's sleep. And and we're talking more about sleep. There's some really good books out there. There's a lot more people are thinking and realizing how important sleep is. And it's not just the number of hours in your bed. It's the quality of the sleep that you have. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people can't get it unless they have their hormones balanced. And, you know, I don't think we should feel ashamed by thinking that taking HRT really does improve sleep for so many women. Absolutely. Um, so what... Um... I guess what what's what, with different life stages and hormonal changes. Let's say it's I don't know pregnancy or um, uh, perimenopause or menopause. What is normal? What what? How does our sleep change? Is there an is there a is there a normal zone of change that we have to kind of accept? Not really. Um, no, I think I mean the whole thing about what's normal. We're all different, aren't we? But I think our sleep patterns change a lot anyway. Um, but they can certainly get worse. And a lot of people think it's worse because we're older, but often it is the hormones. And, and like you say, what happens for a lot of women is they become perimenopausal first. So peri just means around the time of menopause is when periods stop. So for many years, sometimes a decade or so, people find that their hormone levels reduce and they're experiencing some menopausal symptoms, but they're still getting periods. The yeah. periods often change in nature or frequency. So it's very, because they're getting periods, they're thinking, well, it can't be related to my hormones, you know. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, I had symptoms for a little while. I kept waking up at four in the morning with no reason. I wasn't anxious. I wasn't stressed. I kept thinking, this is awful. I'm going to be so tired in the morning. And then early morning waking is a symptom of, of depression. And I kept thinking, well, am I depressed? Maybe I'm depressed. No, of course I'm not depressed. I'm not. Low. And you have all these thoughts in your mind. And, you know, I didn't, I don't know why. I didn't even realize it was related to my hormones because I was too busy doing menopause work you know but um and it, and it is really crippling and can really affect so um and then some nights you won't be fine especially if you're perimenopausal what happens is you have some days where your hormone levels are very low other times that they're fine so yeah you start your period hello <laughs> yeah. and so often with people like that we just top up with some estrogen so you don't have um hrt all the time you just top it up on the days that you're feeling that you need it which is classic okay um so that's a, that's a really helpful question actually is, is at what point should someone seek help with their hormones when, when you know because obviously like you say it's not it's not like you wake up one day and you're perimenopausal no, it's, it's not, a gradual it's not, process yeah, absolutely and and the, the important thing to know is there's not one test to diagnose the perimenopause or menopause you can't go to a doctor and if you do go to a doctor who thinks they can test you you shouldn't be going to that doctor because they're probably just charging a lot of money for inappropriate test so okay. it's on symptoms so the best thing really would be to download a um, menopause symptom tracker even if you think you're not menopausal but you might be perimenopausal on my website menopausedoctors.co.uk you can just put in questionnaire as well yeah. or um you know the app i've got a little card here with the pictures Simply the balance yes now i downloaded it this morning yeah so you can download Fabulous. your you can put your symptoms on that and you can also track your periods as well um, yeah. And if you're, what, what we suggest certainly with the app, you get a reminder every three months to, to fill it out. And it's worth just filling it out. And if you're not sure, fill it out again in three months' time. And if you see that your symptoms have changed, and then think about your periods and if they've changed a little bit, well, you've made your own diagnosis. And, yeah. you know, the important thing is getting help early because 
we don't get a medal as women for, for even getting to the menopause or getting worse symptoms. You know, no one will say, well done, you've given up your job, you're now having a terrible life, you've put on weight, you're now at risk of heart disease even more. So actually, if you are getting symptoms and you think, is it perimenopause, then go and talk to someone mm. who understands hormones. And like I said, often what we do is, is just think of it as a replacement. So if you were deficient of iron, you wouldn't wait till you had no iron in your body before you took an iron supplement. Exactly. You would just take a little bit or you would think about your diet. You can't mm. get estrogen from your diet. You can get very low levels of phytoestrogens from things like flax seeds, but not enough. Um, so yeah. you think about replacing and then with time you increase and it's not just about helping your symptoms as soon as you start to drop your hormone levels is when you have an increased bone turnover it's when you have increased inflammation in your blood vessels when you're more likely to get disease so the earlier you start replacing with hormones the better for your future health so it's, it's really important people often think well I wait till I'm really bad and then I'll get help. Well, why? I mean, I, actually, it's, it's good to talk about this now because actually we just had a question about can I go to my GP with this? And I have a suspicion that if I went to my GP in my early 40s and said I think I'm perimenopausal, mm -hmm. they would give me pretty short shrift. <laughs> well, well, the thing is they shouldn't. And I think a lot of work I'm trying to do is to try and help women have the right knowledge and information so they can actually educate their doctors and healthcare professionals. So you maybe as a perimenopausal woman would say, well, look, I've read this information. I understand that I can have some hormones and I would like to replace my hormones even in the second half of my cycle when my hormone level is low and top up with some estrogen. And I'd like to try that for three months and assess my response. I know yeah. I'm not going to have a risk of breast cancer because my, um, I'm young and all I'm yeah. doing is replacing estrogen and estrogen is safe. And if they say no, you should really then say, but why? because there's no reason that they should do that. If you had an underactive thyroid gland, you would start giving yourself some thyroxine and your doctor would do that. So often it's because of misinformation really. And it's very hard to stand up to your doctor or nurse, but if you feel it doesn't sit right with what you've read and what you've read is evidence-based, then you should push back really, because yeah. you know, it's about our future lives. There's no point waiting until you get help in a few years time because every day could be our last you know we want to make the yeah. most of life yeah and, and and like you say this can go on for 10 or more years that is Absolutely. far far too yeah. long yeah mm. yeah okay brilliant um uh, i'll come back to sleep um very quickly so what what are the the signs that we might need to see to know that hormones are affecting our sleep so what are the kind of red flags Certainly if anyone's getting any vasomotor symptoms, so hot flushes, night sweats, if you're getting night sweats and your periods are changing and perhaps you're getting other symptoms, then really that's a red flag for thinking about your hormones. Mm. There are other medical reasons why people have night sweats, but they're less common. So as a doctor, we always think of the commoner things first. So certainly that if you're getting any other symptoms um, that we've talked about and your sleep pattern is changing, you know, if there's a reason, if you can't think of a reason Clearly, if you have a very exciting day ahead of you or a very worrying day ahead of you, <clears throat> then it's likely to be related to that. The other thing also is looking at your lifestyle because a lot of women I speak to um, drink more alcohol because they think it's going to improve their symptoms, help them sleep. Drinking alcohol is really bad for sleep. So okay. you know, think about the simple... There, we've had it. That's room. very black and white, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it's... It's very easy for me to say, I don't drink alcohol at all, so I don't miss it, but I'm quite extreme. Um, and a lot of people find that if you are going to drink alcohol, have some alcohol-free time. Yeah. Um, think about drinking slightly earlier rather than before you go to bed. Think of the yeah. type of alcohol that you're having. And think about the hidden calories in alcohol as well, because that's sometimes enough to put you off. So, um, but it, it is looking, and also looking about when you eat, because that can make effect or the types of food, you know. Um, mm. chocolate contains caffeine which is a stimulant a lot of people have a bit of cho sleepy chocolate before yeah. they go to bed you know I don't do any caffeine at all but again I'm quite extreme but and also but we are all different some people different. can drink an espresso at 11 o'clock and go yeah. to sleep like um, a baby so. so it's very easy me coming on here and saying it's all your hormones and probably 90% of the time it is but it's not just about replacing your hormones you yeah. know if I I clearly take HRT I'm very open about it but if I took HRT, drank 10 pints of beer every night and um, was having a 
three coffees just before I got into bed and was on my phone just before I switched my light off, my sleep's not going to be good. And that's nothing yeah. to do with my hormones. So it's, it, and that's what's very important about any sort of menopause, perimenopause care is looking really holistically. Yeah. It, you know, I often say to women, let's balance your hormones, but let's think about everything else. But yeah. it's often easier to look at everything else when you've got your hormones balanced because otherwise you're torturing yourself by yeah. trying to get the best sleep. But actually that's much. where something like your mm. balance app can really come into its own because it's about discovering what your normal is. Yes. And, 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 and keeping a sort of diary is so yeah, helpful. Yeah, no, it's really important because we're all busy and um, most of us don't focus on ourselves because we've got other demands and we've got mm. family mm. or we've got our jobs or we've got a combination of everything mm. going on in our brains. So, you know, the reason we developed the app, really, I, I strongly feel that every woman should download it when they're young and then do it because you don't yeah. notice the change. And other people might notice the change but be too scared to tell you or think it's because of something else. You know, the amount of times people say, oh gosh, my period stopped the time that my mother died or I had a job promotion. And then all my symptoms of anxiety, stress, poor sleep, memory problems, I thought was because I was bereaved or because I was too stressed at work. I didn't connect it with my periods. And, and, but if you've got a questionnaire that's reminding you and information yeah. that you're being given, then you can just feel stronger as a person because... You know, now we live for decades being menopausal. The average age of death in women, thankfully, is 82. The average time of the menopause is 51. So mm. it's about a third of our lives, hopefully, will be menopausal. Yet yeah. Most people don't get any medical interaction, whereas when someone's pregnant, it only takes, it's only nine months, but they get loads of healthcare advice and support, which is completely wrong in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I noticed actually on the Balance app, you're running a sleep experiment at the moment, which people can sign up to take part yes. in, can't they? Yeah, Where you're exactly. asking them yeah. to go to bed and wake mm -hmm. up at exactly the same time for seven days. Yeah, and that's really important. And that sounds like torture, doesn't it? Because you think, goodness me, if I, I'm not going to sleep, I need to lie in at the weekend. I need to make up that sleep bank. And um, But actually what you should really try and do is concentrate your time in bed. Because otherwise, if you're not sleeping well, as soon as you get into bed, it's a very negative connotation. You think, I'm not going to sleep well. I know I'm not. And then all this negativity comes in. So you go to bed when you're tired. And then you get up even when you're tired. Because then you're more likely to sleep the next night as right. well. And not feel bad that you, you know, don't, don't think back about how awful your last night's sleep was. It's more about thinking how good it's going to be the next That's the hard night. thing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. but so how, how much is enough sleep with the caveat that we're all different? Uh, you see, that really varies. <laughs> so I mean, most people say about seven or eight hours sleep a night is good, but it depends on the type of sleep. So mm. um, um, I, when I, before I was getting symptoms, I was actually um, always sort of had about seven, eight hours. And then when I was perimenopausal, I was in bed a lot longer, but I was sleeping dreadfully. The quality, I, yeah. I, yeah, now I probably sleep six, six and a half hours a night because I'm quite busy. But I go to bed, I sleep and I wake up. I have, yeah. I shouldn't really tell people here, but I do have a really good sleep. Um, and that's yeah. enough for me. And even at the weekend, I still get up at six o'clock because I want to keep that routine going. And, yeah. and it works for me. You know, some people might, you know, and we're all different. My teenage children need to lie in in the morning on a, <laughs> at a weekend. You know, they they, they, it's how they recharge and their body clock is different and you know mm. my, my husband for example has always been very good at going to bed late and he gets up a bit later but he comes alive in the evening and and so I think we need to be in tune with our circadian rhythm yeah it's really important so I feel quite strongly when people say you have to go to bed at this time you have to wake up at this time mm. already you're going to fail and that's going to make you feel even worse so I've, I've got a couple of um uh, not quite teenagers tweens <laughs> And we're just getting into that phase where I'm peeling them out of bed in the mornings, mm -hmm. having to rip the duvet off them to wake them up. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the next five years, let me tell you. Um, uh, I've got a couple of questions that people have actually sent in before, before we went live, if that's okay. Um, why is my sleep disrupted in the couple of days before I get my period? I lie awake feeling anxious with my heart racing. Is there anything I can do to help? Yeah, again, likely that's, it's likely to be related to low estrogen levels because they, they classically, our hormone levels are changing all the time when we have periods. And just before the uh, periods in the few days before, that's when estrogen levels drop. 
And so um, some people get PMS where they've become more irritable, more tired, more short-tempered, lower in their mood around that time as well. And one of the treatments is to give some estrogen gel. So it's just a very low dose of estrogen. Mm. It's rubbed in through the skin, so there's no risk of clot. It's very, very safe. It's made derived from the yams, the root vegetable. It's mm. the same molecular structure as a hormone we produce. And you just top it up. Um, okay. And that can work really well. And like I was saying... So even, often, even for someone in their early 40s who yeah. doesn't necessarily think they're perimenopausal, they have yeah. those two days of there's disruptive big, sleep. Yeah, there's a big overlap So with PMS and perimenopause. So PMS okay. is literally the days before the periods. And then periods might still be regular at that time. And then periods often become a bit more irregular or they might change that they become heavier or lighter. Um, and then that's a sign that your hormones are just gradually declining. Mm. Um, so yeah it's even though it's a form of hrt it giving um the estrogen gel is a lot safer than giving the contraception which is very synthetic and it's a and what's that actually called if someone again wanted to go to their gp so and ask for something just, yeah just estrogen gel estrogen so, gel yeah if um anyone goes onto my website and puts in pms um then we've got uh, there's a a booklet that I've written that you can just download. Yeah, okay, it. fine. And that's newsonhealth.com? No, it's, it's menopausedoctor.co.uk. Menopausedoctor.co.uk. Yeah, and under the okay. resources section as well. And then I've done a podcast actually about PMS with Dr. Hannah Short. That's, okay. We'll talk about it in there. Um, just quickly, there's a question that I actually think it would be really lovely if we could answer. Um, someone's saying, can we talk about shift work and health workers we sleep? So people that are working nights, you know, one week on, one week yeah. off. It's, what do they do? Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I used to do shifts um, when I worked in New Zealand for as a junior doctor. And talking to other people, everyone has seems to have their own coping mechanisms. And it depends on the hours that they do and how many hours. So I used to do a week on and a week of days, a week of nights. And mm. somehow that was harder because you week, day four or five, you get into this other routine. And then you'd have to go flip back again. Whereas some people just do two night shifts or three night shifts and they can almost keep their own rhythm. But I think it's trying to change to the new new time. It's a bit like jet lag. You try and change to the new time as, as quickly as possible. Mm. And the other thing is thinking about your eating because eating is really important to, to signal that your brain that um, you should be awake. So, you know, try and have your meal times at times that you should be when you're awake rather than just thinking, oh, well, I'll work all day because I, or work all shift because it's overnight and then I'll come home and have a big meal and then I'll go to sleep. Because then you're So definitely try, try and take, trying to take that break mid shift to eat. Yeah, so definitely. definitely. Even if you're not hungry, it's really important because again, it's stimulating different hormones in your body. And the other hormone, like I said earlier, cortisol, our stress hormone really does increase and um, if we're stressed, that will stop us sleeping as well. So mm. you want to be obviously as calm as you can, which isn't easy when you're working shifts, but it's trying to almost trick the body into this is a routine that's normal for you. Um, I tell you something that I talk about with my friends a lot is, is it getting worse? Like, are we getting, I feel like I didn't hear our mothers talk about mm. their symptoms and that's partly because no one talked about the menopause, but I don't remember seeing my mother suffer particularly right during the menopause I remember that but the sort of in her 40s she seemed to just breeze through it and is that right <laughs> I think I think it's very different because what we're doing in our 40s is probably very different to what our mothers did in their 40s yeah. as well you know we're running homes we're running jobs we're ferrying our children you know the, the amount of activities my children have done over the last 18 years is very <laughs> different to ones that I did for example so so there, there's different demands. Our diets are different. You know, yeah. people um, drink in a different way, drink alcohol in a different way. What we eat is different. Um, even the way we rest and the way we switch off is very different how it used to be. So, and I think we're just more more vocal as well. Yeah. There's a lot of people there um, in their sort of 70s, 80s, would be 90s now who were given diazepam in their 40s because they were very anxious and so they couldn't sleep well. Yeah. So certainly as a doctor, I had a lot of women who were addicted to diazepam. And I look back and it was started in their 40s and 50s. And sleep Interesting. Habits. And it will all be related to their menopause, but no one yeah. thinks about it. So I think um, some of the conversation that I'm trying to do is to make it more open. But also a lot of women are misdiagnosed with conditions such as 
chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, um, worsening migraines, recurrent urinary tract infections. And no one thinks about their hormones, where of course all these women are perimenopausal or menopausal. So we're just labeling people differently. But the good yeah. thing about being labeled is that you can then get the right help and treatment rather than just managing the isolated symptom, which is what's happened before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just seeing the time and I know that you've got a podcast to record. I'm going to do one final question. And if it's okay, I'm going to make it a skin related question just yeah, you know, for, for obvious reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually had a question from someone saying, what can I do to stop the discol discoloration on my skin due to hormones? I have thyroid cancer. So it'd be great if you could answer that, but also um, perhaps just very generally talk about the effect on the skin of the perimenopause and menopause. Yeah, so skin changes are really, really common. And um, I have done a podcast actually with a dermatologist we work closely, which is available on my menopause.org website. But what happens basically is estrogen, as I've already said, gets all around our body but it also helps our skin. So it helps improve the blood supply to our skin. It also helps build collagen, which is like the building block, if you like, of our skin. Um, and it helps um, with the elasticity as well. A lot of women find their skin becomes dry. Um, it can become um, less elastic. Just this sort of, the complexion isn't quite as, quite as good. People sometimes find their skin becomes very itchy. Um, some people get this condition called formication, which is a bit like fine little spiders running across your arms or legs, which is often worse at night when hormone levels are low and it, and it can be really distressing. Um, some people do have discoloration on their skin, um, which is called melasma, and this is often due to skin damage in, in the past. Mm. Um, and then some people find that they have acne, which they might have been delighted not to have since they're teenagers, and it all comes back. But again, this is often due to the imbalance of hormones. Um, and skin can be more sensitive as well. So yeah. it's very important, um, obviously, seeing what you put on your skin and also mm. within. So obviously, as you know, looking at diet is really important. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the forms, forms of exercise, um, but also looking at hormones, because obviously replacing with estrogen will help reverse all those changes. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's 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 not just one thing. It's looking at everything as important. Well, in my experience, uh, sensitivity in the sort of mm. you know the menopause years, let's say, uh, is very often related to the fact that your skin is getting drier because dry skin very often becomes sensitive skin because your mm. your kind of barrier and your protect the, that protective yeah. element that the skin you know the sort mm. of keeping stuff out but you know also keeping stuff That's in right, it's that you know the epidermis and the dermis become a lot thinner so yeah they're, they're going to be more irritated by things that you wouldn't have noticed when your skin was thicker so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's very important and as you know more than i do some of the uh, products that you could use when you were younger and slap on your face when you look at what they contain there's so many things that they will cause irritants so it's it's important to um, just have reflect what you're using on your skin and if it's the yeah. same face cream that you've used for 20 years it's probably a time to look and see what else you could be using. yeah we yeah always be reassessing and mm. you know and also trust your instincts I know the minute I put something on my face or on my skin whether or not it works for me I can just tell instantly yes, so yeah. trust your own instincts with that and if you think it's not right then look to switch it up but keep things really really nourishing um, and and always be thinking about kind of boosting your lipid levels um, and your hydration levels as you age, just very simply. Yeah. <laughs> um, Louise, thank you very, very much. Um, thank you for It was really, me. really informative. And I, we've had tons of questions that we haven't got to, and I'm really sorry, but Louise is off to um, record a podcast. And she has a wealth of information on her website. Um, I encourage you all to download her free, I should say, app. It is free. It's called Balance. Yeah. It's on the App Store. Um, I've just joined, and I'm off to go and spend some time on it this afternoon. Um, <laughs> And thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.